Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. A very warm welcome to all of you in this uh, lecture number 13 of this course. So the title of the course is Democratic Processes and Social Movements and as a part of that we are here to discuss about development processes and social movement. So uh, there is an intrinsic link between uh, democracy and development because all the countries aspire to become developed countries and then there are countries which are developing countries. So development is something which is uh, so central to the idea of politics because through politics we aspire to have development of a country. So uh, this lecture will focus on the link between development processes and social movements and specifically we will be discussing about the same in the Indian context but at the same time the, uh, the lecture will also refer to the global context in order to understand the idea of development. So let me first uh, have the introduction in this first slide. So what is development and I am sure that all of you must have heard of development quite a lot because we often talk about say things like personality development or development of a region which we call regional development or development of a country or development of the world. So development, the term development can be used in different contexts and then as per the context its meaning may differ. But here how are we going to talk about development in the context of this particular lecture or how have we designed it as part of this course. So let me tell you about the development as a discourse. The term discourse is something that we often use as you can say replacement of something like concept or discourse is something which shapes the ideas. So for example the modern discourse. So if we mention the term modernity then it has its corollary like the significance of time or it will tell us about rationality that we should think in terms of what is good for us. So similar to modernity even like development is one of the key concepts which came up as part of modernity. Let uh, Here I have put four readings and uh, those readings which have now defined development in different ways. So let me tell you that development is one you can say one big kind of a concept around which there are different kinds of studies. For example, there is something called development studies. So development studies in itself has now become a field of study. So there we study about say relation between development and change. Then we may study about uh, relationship between development and health. So different kinds of things may be linked with development. So here I have given you four examples. For example, this book titled Encountering Development by Escobar. This book came in 1995 and the subtitle of this book is the making and unmaking of the third world. So as the title itself suggests that this book focuses on the idea of third world and it says that this idea of third world is basically around the idea of development because we have now uh, divided the world between two categories. One is the developed country which we consider as being superior and then there is developing countries and developing countries is something which is also known as third world, the group of countries and another way of calling these countries is that we call it global north versus global south. So all the developing countries are since if you look at the globe then they are in the southern part of the globe. So uh, those countries we call as the global south together as a whole and the countries in the developed uh, side are the global north. So be it Europe or be it America, 
most of these countries are in the global north. So, uh, Escobar argues that it is the development which becomes the defining character for dividing this the world into two parts, the first world and third world. So, he calls it encountering development and he says that we need to be little critical about the idea of development as in the same idea of development which may be good for one section of the society can be difficult for the other section of the society and thus here I would say that uh, the occurrence of numerous social movements in a country like India is partly because not that all the people are equally benefited by development. So, there is this link between development and social movement that we are going to study. The next book that I have mentioned is the book by Aditya Nigam titled as Desire Named Development. Now this book Desire Named Development, this book talks about the impact of neoliberal capitalism. So how has Indian economy been shaped by this uh, liberal capitalism? And then it goes on to tell us about its negative impact on the peasantry means the farming section have not been uh, positively uh, benefited. So, in that sense uh, we come across numerous anti SEZ movements, SEZs are special economic zones. So, sometimes what happens is that the farming areas are often forced uh, they are forcefully converted into the industrial areas. So, that is also another problem. So, what looks like development on the one hand may actually be problematic for the other sections of the society and the farming community being one of those sections which are adversely affected. So, which all are the places where we get to see such uh, movements by the peasantry are say Kalinganagar, Singur, Nandigram. So, the parts of West Bengal and Odisha are the places where there is a theft of agricultural land from the poor farmers in the name of progress. So, progress which we often consider as industrial development that is at the cost of agricultural sector. So, agricultural land is converted into industrial sector. Third writing that I have mentioned is by Asima Sinha who has written an article why has development become a political issue in Indian politics? So, let me just tell you quickly that how have we moved. So, the first one was in a global context, development itself being the central idea and how it divides the world into first world and third world or say developing countries and developed countries. In the second one in Aditya Nigam's book, Desire Named Development, it talks about development as a process and how it affects the certain section of society in a bad way. Then this article Asima Sinha, she poses this idea of development being so central to Indian politics. So while we will discuss about ideas like say caste and class which have a huge impact on Indian politics, on the other hand Asima Sinha is saying that now development has become a political issue. So, this is something that we will remember that if development becomes a political issue, then how does it affect the society? So, certainly it will have an impact on politics, but since politics is an intrinsic part of society itself and we cannot bifurcate the two, the politics and the society cannot be bifurcated. So, how does she argue? What all does she say? Asima Sena, she says that now the issues like economic growth, that is one, employment, access to public goods. What are the public goods such as infrastructure, electricity, education, healthcare. So, these are the things which are now dominating the electoral discourse and political discussions. So, while in the beginning it was mostly the religion or caste which played important role in terms of how will people vote. Now people look forward to that whether their leaders are delivering these public goods to them or not. Do they have infrastructure, do they have electricity, good services regarding say education or health. So on the basis of all these Asima Sinha argues that in India now development has become a political issue.
And the last article that I have mentioned is one of the articles by Surjit Bhalla in Indian Express and I haven't mentioned the title but I have quoted him. What does he say? He says, it is just that unknown to the Congress and the left but known to everyone else, the voter is demanding the same thing from all the politicians, infrastructure that is electricity, jobs and water. The voter is saying, give us development, stupid, and only the stupid are not listening. So here the leaders have been called the stupid and that's how the voters look at the uh, leaders. So uh, no matter which uh, party is asking them for the vote, they ask the leaders for the same thing. So no more ideology has remained that important because people are looking for better uh, life conditions and better life conditions will be possible only when they have infrastructure. So in that sense now even Surjit Bhalla is following what Asima Sinha is arguing. Both of them are of the view that development has become an important political issue and it is shaping the Indian politics in a major way. So I hope that it, it now gives you a background and you are more or less clear about the idea of development. Now let us discuss about what, why and how of development. So let me tell you quickly that the idea of development has its changing meaning. Sometimes it can be about economic development, it can be about social development, it can be about political development. So these are the facets of development. So I don't think so that there is a need to explain these when we will talk about the economic development then it will be about say increasing the GDP or that per capita income should increase. When we will talk about social development then uh, infrastructure like health and uh, health and education should improve and when we will talk about political development then our political scenario should be uh, better than as it was earlier. The next point that I have posed is what about ecological development because most of the times when we go for more and more of industries then it is at the cost of our ecological degradation means how do we strike a balance between the economy and the ecology that remains the key question. So we are aware of the idea of sustainable development. So if we consider sustainable development as the key concept or you can say as the organizing principle then it will then we will be able to strike a balance between the two the environment and the uh, environment and the economy so there are four pillars of sustainability suppose we want the sustainable development to take place how will we do that so there are four pillars we will have to strike a balance between them so there will be human aspect there will be social aspect economic aspect and environment. So all the four need to be given equal attention. When we say human development that means the adequate working condition should be there, there should be an amount of rest for the human beings, then good food should be available for the human beings, the health facility should be there. So the human uh, development is possible when every person has say uh, uh, the drinking the clean drinking water is available clean air is available all these things will only uh, ensure that people can live a good life then similarly the social uh, condition if for the social development if all the individuals will be living in a good facility then it will eventually improve the social aspect similarly economic aspect again the people should have good purchasing power per capita income should improve and environment again if for environment you should have clean river uh, you should have ample amount of trees around yourself then these are the four uh, pillars which will ensure sustainability in any society now there are five dimensions of sustainable development that is in a global context there are people there is planet there has to be prosperity peace and partnership so actually these five p's are mentioned in the sustainable development goals SDGs you must have heard of sustainable development goals that if worldwide people have to progress then we have to follow these principles of sustainable development and for that all these five need to come together people planet 
prosperity, peace and partnership. So, if anyone is left behind or say if any country is left behind, then we cannot have a global prosperity. Now, coming to the paths of development, how will we have development? Suppose an XYZ, any country wants to uh, have development, then what path will it take? It can either take a capitalist path or it can take a socialist path or there can also be mixed economy and it can also be radical ecology. So, the capitalist path will say that there has to be industrialization. We cannot prosper as a country unless we have enough industries. Then they will also say that there should be free market means the state should not interfere much. If we will have the socialist uh, kind of a system, socialist path to development, then it will be state controlled industries. So, in the capitalist uh, model, the industries are controlled by the capitalist class, but in socialism, it, uh, all the industrial uh, things or all the mode of production thing is actually regulated by the state itself. Now, when we say mixed economy, then it has the mix and match of both and it wants to take the good uh, uh, you can say uh, the positive aspects of both capitalist and socialist as India did. India adopted mixed economy and uh, if uh, we will be learning about these things in the next slides about our adoption of five year plans or the formation of planning commission. So, these are the things how mixed economy works. Then radical ecology is uh, another model which keeps ecology in the center. It says that as much importance we give to the economy, we should equally give importance to the ecology. So that is another model. Now that is the, uh, the next point is that there is a basis of classification of countries. The worldwide countries are divided on the basis of development and thus we have the developed countries, we have developing countries and we have underdeveloped countries means those countries which are yet to undergo development they are called the underdeveloped countries. So, I am sure you are now pretty aware that development is overall one of the key concepts in uh, not only political science but also say uh, things like say sociology or many other disciplines where we study about development. Now we move on to because so far we talked about development as an idea. Now we move to development planning. So when we add the term planning with development that becomes development planning and we are going to talk about the Indian state in pre-independence period means the idea of development and planning goes back to the pre-independence days. So what is planning? We often go for planning. We plan how to study. We plan our travel trips. How we, So, planning is something which is one of the most important things before we do something. So, before we do, we plan. So, we may have our financial planning that we need to save this much of amount of money in order to do certain task after 10 years. So, that is planning. So, planning is an, is an act of instrumental rationality. So, it is an exercise. So, similar to what people plan, they plan their savings, they plan their travels, they plan their studies. Similarly, a country also needs to plan. Where does it want to see itself after 10 years? Where does a country want to reach in next 20 years? So, this idea of planning is something that started in the 1940s itself. And it emerged as a crucial institutional modality by which the state would determine the material allocation of productive resources within the nation. So, what are productive resources? So, this term you should try to understand material allocation of productive resources. So, suppose whatever minerals you have or uh, say other economic assets that you have, it can be land, it can be forests, all these are your productive resources because you tend to generate things out of that and then you have the, they have their certain selling value. So, how are we going to distribute this because you have a population and you have your resources. So, what will be the way to allocate who will get what is something that is decided through planning. So, it was in February 1938 
that in the Haripura Congress, this decision was taken that something like a planning commission we will have to make. And as a result, in October 1938, National Planning Committee NPC was formed under the leadership of Nehru, but it could work only until 1940. So, this organization, National Planning Committee NPC, was something that came before Planning Commission and it worked for merely two years because then Nehru had gone to jail at that time. Now, we move on to the features of development planning, as in what are the features, how does development planning take place. So, there are three main features. One, that it is a form of determining the state policy, means the state decides for itself what kind of policy will it make. So, planning has a policy aspect. Then second, planning is done by a body of experts and there will be a technical evaluation. So, for example, whether there should be a construction of a dam or not or uh, whether there will be a bridge somewhere or what will be the path of uh, construction of a road or if the road is to be constructed in the hilly areas then what kind of construction will be safe. So, all these things need technical evaluation. So, you need the engineers, uh, the social science experts, then sometimes if you have to make policies regarding the agricultural practices then you need it from the farmers also. So, these are the things that planning is often done by a body of experts. Then the third thing is that the polit political debate among the experts. So, on the same issue there can be different opinion for example, whether the construction of a dam should take place or not. So, if the if you will have the people uh, who are in favor of dam for example, the the, any industry which is into the dam construction. So, that will be interested that the dam should be constructed and the people who will be affected by that uh, construction of the dam, those tribals, they may say that no, there should be no construction of dam. So, in that sense, such a political debate among the experts, the different experts who are there, it is debated among themselves. So, Development as a linear path means what is linear path? The path can be either linear or it can be circular. So, when we move in a line suppose in 1950 India is here, in 1970 it will reach here, by 1990 it aims to reach here. So, linear means you are moving from one direction to another and in that you are going to measure your progress that where have you reached and there you take up your different sectors like health, education and technology. So, for example, you can say that you need to have you aim at having 90 percent of your population as educated. So, you want the literacy level to be as high as 90 plus. So, for that you have to invest in infrastructure you will have to make that many number of schools and colleges so that you could educate the large number of people. Then if you want the health facility to reach to a larger section of the society, then you should have the construction of the hospitals. So, this is the way how we aim at development or how a country aims at development. Now, there are two parts of development planning. One is the making of a plan and second is the implementation. So, as I told you about the plans that we make regarding our travel also or our financial planning. So, first we make the plan and then we try to execute that or we try to implement that. So, just thinking by if we just make the plan, just making will not be enough. You also have to execute it and in order to execute you should have the what you say is preparation of your plan. You may need certain things for example, if you have to go for running then you have to keep a bottle of water with you or if you have to go for running you have to wear a good uh, kind of shoes for that. So, every planning that you do you have to uh, think of the things that you will be needing for doing that thing. So, implementation requires so first is the uh, making of a plan and second is the implementation and you also have to keep in mind the time period. So, whatever plan you make you also have to decide that in what amount of time 
you are going to execute that plan so in that sense it was the five year plans which came as a mechanism that india decided that it will have its five year plans that from one plan to another it will keep certain markers that where will it reach in the first five years then in the next five years and that way so accumulation and legitimation these are the twin problems of planning so sometimes what happens is that we tend to accumulate so certain things can be just the process of accumulation that suppose we will do something in the later and legitimation how do you legitimize the process these are the two things regarding planning that we need to keep in mind now coming to the overview of five year plans in india so basically here i am going to tell you about what are the things that have been achieved through five year plans in india so one was the high growth rate it aimed at high growth rate to improve the living standard of the residents of india so that was the first and foremost thing that the living condition should improve second was that economic stability for prosperity so in order to have prosperity of the country you need to have economic stability so that was second third was self reliant economy so planning was aiming at a self reliant economy and here you may remember what were the ways for example one was green revolution that gave us food sufficiency so this one i gave you as one example as in how do we become self reliant economy so through green revolution we became food sufficient country similarly if you look at our data regarding our prosperity in vis a vis education then the literacy percentage has gone up drastically as we were at say 30s at the time of independence and now we are 70 plus so that way be it health or education these are the sectors where we want to improve and that's how a country like india which is now a developing country but it it aims at becoming a developed country so next issue is the social justice and reducing the inequalities now this point is very important to understand that here the measures like reservation become very important that certain sections of the society if they are not that well off for a very long time how will they improve and for that they need better opportunities and in order to get that there is a provision for reservation and in india the reservation is given in three sectors first sector is education that in the educational institutions the seats are reserved then the second way is that of in the employment means for in the government jobs there is a reservation and third is in the political representation so these three are the ways to ensure that the social justice thing happens and initially it was just uh, 22.5% seats were reserved and that was for the scs and sts and later on in the year 1990 27% reservation was further given to the obcs means the other backward caste and that way now overall the reservation has gone up to 49.5% so here i mentioned all these things because how india as a country has aimed at social justice in order to reduce the inequalities and the last point i have mentioned is that modernization of the economy so five year plans aimed at getting the to have the modernization of the economy so these were the five long term goals of the five year plans in india so if we crudely look at the first eight five year plans means say 40 years plus 2 3 years more because in the years of emergency even the five year plans were suspended so that way it becomes 40 plus 2 so it becomes 42 years and uh, there were gap years when the five year plans were dropped for some time so first eight plans actually aimed at more of public sector development was there so the indian economy was more of dominated by the state run industries 
so uh, public sector undertakings were playing an important role but if we look at from uh, the ninth five year plan uh, from 1997 onwards then from there you see there is a shift from uh, the government being the main key player to government being just a facilitator so there is a difference between the two when the government itself plays the whole and sole uh, role because for instance railways is one sector which is which was controlled by the government and railways is also one of the biggest revenue giving sector for india so it was also giving the government jobs to a large section of the society as well as the money that came from say the tickets etc but now you get to see that even in railway we have gradually we are gradually uh, shifting to switching over to the private sector so is the case with uh, be it health be it education or even in terms of airlines now uh, earlier air india had the highest number of flights but now mostly it is the private sector which is dominating so this shift we can see in the five year plans that in the first eight five year plans the public sector was dominant but from the ninth uh, five year plan onwards it is the private sector which became more dominant now this point i have mentioned as planning commission to niti aayog so what happened is that that no more planning commission as a body is functioning and now we have another uh, body which is named as niti aayog so so far there were 12 five year plans by the planning commission and the last plan that is the 12th five year plan was from 2012 to 2017 so now it is almost 6 years that no more we are going, we are having five year plans and it led to the 12th five year plan led to the end of five year plan system in india and eventually the planning commission was dissolved on 17th august 2014 so in fact this 12th plan was in between it was midway when planning commission as a body was dissolved and rather it was replaced by another body called niti aayog and the full form of niti is national institution for transforming india now if you look at this terminology itself national institution for transforming india so it sounds in such a way that it has a kind of a corporate kind of corporate kind of an understanding and it has a it has a post like ceo means chief executive officer who is the head of niti aayog uh, so instead of uh, uh, a body which will uh, force its decision on its counterparts means the state government niti aayog functions more of like just a think tank or just as an advisory body so it gives advices to the states but it does not force them to act as per their suggestions so niti aayog is headed by the ceo who is appointed by the prime minister and it also has a governing council so that's how niti aayog functions now i come to the point the links between development process and social movements so far we have discussed a lot about development and uh, that too in two contexts we were talking in the global context and then we also talked about it in the indian context now how will we link it to social movement so the idea of development the meaning of development doesn't have the same meaning for everyone for example the narmada bachao andolan of 1980s the construction of sardar sarovar dam and its impact on three states gujarat madhya pradesh and maharashtra it was to be seen as the pride of the nation so when a country goes for construction of a huge dam then it is considered that the country should feel very proud of that it it becomes a status symbol that oh this big dam or this that is the size of the dam you got to boast the idea of big size but what happens is that such huge construction uh, was justified that it is going to give us electricity and electricity was the basis on which it was being justified but what about its impact on agriculture livelihoods river ecology so something that looks development on the one hand that you are going to have two things one 
you will have a huge dam a big dam to feel proud about and then second uh, you will have the electricity uh, production but the negative impact of such a construction is much more because you it will lead to a huge amount of displacement a lot many people need to be shifted from one place to another then the ecology of that area uh, the flora fauna all the the trees plants etc or even uh, the submergence of agricultural land a lot of uh, land will also go or will be drowned in the water many of the villages need to be drowned so these are the issues that we need to take care of and sometimes what happens is that those people have to uh, shift to other areas and they are often called the ecological uh, refugees that due to some ecological problem they had to shift from one place to another so this is the point i wanted to tell you that development is not something that has the same meaning for everyone similarly there is another case i have given here two cases one was narmada bachao and second case of singur case and i will be telling about the details of singur case in the next slide here thus i am not going into the detail third is the niyamgiri andolan where the dongaria kond tribe fought a legal battle against the multinational company called vedanta so there what happened is that vedanta went for the mining in the mountains but the dongaria kond said that this mountain is a god for them they call that mountain as niyam raja and they said that for the company it is only the mining which is important but for us we have been worshiping this mountain for a very long time so what happens is that these are two opposite views of the mountains mountain being seen as a god and mountain being seen as uh, just the source of uh, a, a rich mineral bauxite so in that sense development is something that brings such starkly opposite things in our forefront what is good for someone can be bad for the other community so on the one hand we have development india ha is developing as a country but on the other hand we also have numerous social movements and social movements are actually considered as hallmark of healthy democracy so worldwide any country if it is having social movements then it is considered as that is the sign of a healthy democracy only in a healthy democracy uh, the space is provided to the civil society actor that they may raise their voice the the resonant voice and that leads to things like social movements so in the next point i have talked about the hallmarks of development what are the things that signify development so gross domestic product gdp then purchasing power parity ppp per capita income ppi and human development index hdi these are the ways to measure a country's prosperity because development is something we look at the countries worldwide in terms of development okay so there we got to remember these terms gdp ppp these are the ways how we measure the prosperity of a country so india is world's fifth largest economy by the nominal gdp and third largest country by its by its purchasing power parity so that way it is quite a positive thing if worldwide you are on fifth for gdp and on third for ppp that is a good good one to uh, feel about then next issue is that of hdi the human development index because this is something on which the ranking is done for the worldwide all the countries are ranked by the undp united nations development program so hdi has four components one is life expectancy for health then expected years of schooling means of years of schooling for education and gross national income per capita for standard of living so on the basis of these basically if you look at the, these four then it is about the lives of human beings vis-a-vis -vis their health and education 
income these three are considered health education and income so if you look at india's position worldwide then india was ranked 132 out of 191 countries so when undp did it for the year 2021-22 it is the recent report then it was ranked so out of 191 if india is at 132 then it is not a very good sign so in that sense in terms of human development index we are not doing well so we are doing well in terms of gdp and ppp but we are not doing good as per hdi that means we still need to work upon human development now if we compare it with our neighboring countries then there are two countries bangladesh and sri lanka whose ranking is above india bangladesh is at 129 so not much just the difference uh, of three three places india is at 132 bangladesh is at 129 but sri lanka is much better sri lanka is at 79 and there are two countries which are even worse than india one in nepal nepal is at 143 and pakistan is at 161 so you have something to be happy about and something to be sad so if you look at the countries which are doing better then you feel that oh even you need to improve so in that sense india has a continental size india has a huge population it has excessive population then uh, there is high density of population in a very small area uh, since the population is high so that way the density of the population also is higher then if we look at some of the major problems that india needs to tackle then they are poverty ecological degradation corruption and regional imbalance so these are some of the problems which we still face so we have come a long way in the 75 years of our independence but still we need to do a lot many things in order to improve as to become from developing country to a developed country now i have quickly mentioned about a few cases about say the singur case these three cases three four cases that i have taken up they are primarily to tell you about uh, the stark difference between what we understand as development and why it leads to something like a social movement so for example you see in west bengal politician mamta Banerjee recast herself as people oriented development chief minister so she was saying that she is orienting the development towards people and she looked at it saying that the previous party was actually something which is which was anti-development so in that sense when her party Trinmool Congress was opposing to that Singur project it was said that it is anti-development because whenever any state is going to have an industrial setup and if some political party is opposing to that then it is considered as anti-development so what happened is that when in 2007-2008 the protests started at that time Mamta Banerjee was in opposition so she actually was in favor of the protesters but the Singur factory was closed down and that led to the popularity of Mamta Banerjee and Mamta Banerjee eventually came to power so even though her move was considered anti-development at some point but people ha people supported Mamta Banerjee as she uh, uh, her action led to closure of the plant so Singur movement became a case study where we see how the conversion of agricultural land into industrial land may become problematic or people tend to oppose that so something that we that looks like development may actually lead to social movement now next is plachi Mada case in the case of plachi Mada, it is in palakkad district of kerala uh, a coca-cola plant was to be set up in plachi Mada, and there the villagers soon started facing problems and they started opposing the plant so what happened is that anti coca cola protest started there and then gradually the movement was joined by the activists from all over country and that led to eventually the factory was closed 
there were numerous problems which happened the ground water level had gone down then uh, the chemical that was being produced by the coca cola company it was not good for people's health people were facing skin diseases etc so uh, the problems faced by local people they decided to go for protest and sometimes what happens is that if there is massive protest then uh, the government has to order for the closure of plant as it happened in case of plachimada also overall first of all it was in the 2004 in the year 2004 coca cola plant was closed but since a huge amount of uh, difficulty was faced by the people so a high power committee was set up to study the amount of loss that has happened to the people and that high power committee submitted its report that overall it is the a loss of rupees 216 crore so the amount of land which is no more fit for agricultural purpose then uh, the ground water that has gone has depleted the ground water is uh, no more fit for drinking water so all these are the problems which uh, even though now it is 19 years that the company is closed but people are still facing difficulty regarding their drinking water so this is another case that something like development that a company was to be set up but people led to protest against that now since it is not possible to go into the details of numerous movements because this lecture i have named as development processes and social movement so in this slide i thought i'll just quickly give you few titles for example one is the koila satyagraha in raigarh district of chatisgarh so their people are fighting against mining they are demanding for mining rights for themselves then there is niyamgiri struggle i mentioned about it to you in the previous slide also by the dongaria kondh tribe so this niyamgiri hills these are in the kalahandi and raigarh districts of odisha so most of the mineral rich areas the areas where there is a lot of minerals or now even wherever there are rivers and mountains they face a great difficulty uh, that something that comes in the name of development then uh, that gradually turns into problem for them and the tribals they look at development in a different way they uh, want to live slightly uh, into their own way and they don't want these development projects to affect their lives in a major way then there are numerous anti mining movements also in different parts of odisha and goa here i have mentioned about chatisgarh earlier koila satyagraha but there are also in odisha and goa then recently there was this anti oil refinery movement in maharashtra so even when the oil refinery is set up then that also leads to ecological degradation so now this debate between ecology ecology versus economy has become very very important now let me come to this slide i have mentioned as movement of movements so in india you get to see numerous social movements different types of social movements and in fact you will have a uh, separate chapters or you will have separate uh, lectures on these movements you will have a separate lecture on caste movements then you will have one on the women's movements farmers movements because here i have why have i named it as movement of movements because in the same country a democratic country like india has actually seen numerous movements so there are workers movements there are tribal movements environmental movements i already gave you the example of some of the environmental movements for example plachimada or niyamgiri but let me just quickly tell you that all these movements you should see in terms of pre independence and post independence so that will apply to most of the things even when you will study about farmers movement there also you will have pre independence and post independence because when the indian national movement was going on which we in the short form we call it inm then indian national movement actually composed of different movements it had the section of farmers movement it had workers movement it also had tribal movements so all these movements 
actually contributed to the making of Indian national movement. Here I have mentioned these seven types of movements which tell you about the, uh, the different kinds of social movements in India. The last one, anti-corruption movements, there is this JP movement which took place in 1970s and then there is Anna movement uh, which led to the formation of Amadmi party. So, we will gradually be studying about all these movements one by one, but this introductory lecture first of all tells you about the link between development processes and social movements. Now I move on to the last section of this lecture which is conclusion. So before I conclude, let me quickly recap what all did we do in this lecture. So, so far I first of all defined the idea of development to you. I told you about uh, the idea of development in a global context as well as in the Indian context. Then in one of the slides, I introduced you to the ideas like say GDP, PPP, then PPI per capita income, uh, then uh, something like uh, human development index because these are the things, these are the concepts which tell us that there are numerous ways of measuring the development. If you will measure the development in terms of only your um, economic achievement, then that will look different. If you will look at the human condition, what kind of life is being led by the people, are they living a healthy life or not, then there the healthy life will make you uh, look at the ecology also. If you will have clean air, clean uh, drinking water, then only you can ensure a good life to human being. So, these are the things that you should keep in mind that development does not have one uh, unified kind of definition as such because there can be different ways of defining the development. So, and other than that we also talked about the developing countries, uh, developed countries etc. That development itself becomes the benchmark to look at the countries whether it is developed or developing. But here let me quickly tell you that we mostly uh, decide all these vis-a-vis -vis the economic well-being of the country. We do not take into consideration their ecological condition and in that sense now that the idea of radical ecology has come up, uh, we are gradually becoming aware of the idea of ecology being equally important and uh, recently we also had concepts like say theories like mm, there are rights of the nature. Uh, uh, rights of the mother earth or why do we need to have uh, clean rivers because many of the rivers are now polluted, rivers are at the verge of dying. So, these are the things we need to remember. Now, in order to conclude, let me just come to this point that India is a leader of developing countries and it is one of the fastest growing economy. So, that way it is something that India feels quite proud of that India is doing well in terms of economy. We have already completed 75 years of our freedom and we have achieved economic self-sufficiency as well as the availability of food grains. So, it was the green revolution which led to our uh, self-sufficiency vis-a-vis food grains. Then as a democratic country, we also have the presence of strong civil society. So, civil society tells us about that we can have protests, we have the organized way of having protests. So, we also come across numerous social movements which actually keep a check on the actions by the state. So, sometimes whatever the state is doing is not necessarily given an approval by the people. So, suppose if people are not happy about something, then they may go on for protest and here I will give you uh, one of the examples of the farmers movements because three laws were passed by the parliament and the farmers were not happy about it. So, farmers united themselves as a group and that was the nationwide protest and eventually the government had to take back those laws. So, that is the power of democracy that if a certain section of the society decides to come together and it opposes the laws, then there is a possibility that such laws will be taken back.
So, uh, now I uh, wanted to tell you that Modi, Prime Minister Modi gave call for a term which is which we call life. The full form of life here is lifestyle for environment. He gave this idea at the COP26 in the year 2021. The COP26 was held at Glasgow and there he called the individuals and communities to come together to protect and preserve the environment. So, over and again this term is coming up that we need to protect environment in a major way. And now recently that India got the G20 presidency and India's, India's leadership started from December 2022, the global expectations from India is rising. So, as a result what happens is that our notion of Vasudhev Kutumbukam that the whole world is a family, it is something which is a powerful motto and thus India can actually give a lesson how to balance between ecology and economy. That could be the strength that India may show and for there we need to move from sustainable development to holistic development. Now what will we mean by holistic development? You need to bring individual, society, state, all these three need to be in sync with each other. So while in sustainable development we were looking at only two things that is uh, the economy is to be balanced with ecology. Here in holistic development we are also talking about the spiritual development or you can say the well-being of the human beings means only if a person feels uplifted then only there can be a prosperity of the nation. So in that sense holistic development could be a contribution that India can have as well as balancing between ecology and economy. So with that I bring this lecture to an end and in the last slide I have uh, mentioned about some of the references which you may read. This book by Escobar, Encountering Development you may read, even Design Named Development by Aditya Nigam. These are some of the writings that I have mentioned but you can always read little bit more that you come across which tells you about relationship between development and social process. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture. In case you have any difficulty, you may write an email to me. My email ID is jnuruchi at the rate of gmail.com. So I hope you are doing well and with that it comes to an end. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvellous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. 
they are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.